Well, hello, class of 1970. Wherever you may be Zooming in from, I want to welcome you to today's historical tour of our beloved Holy Cross, titled Hidden, Virtually in Plain Sight. My name is Tom Cadigan. I serve as the Associate Director in the Office of Alumni Relations, and I am also a proud member of the class of 2002. Now, I majored in history, served as a tour guide through the admissions office during my undergraduate years, and in the category of other duties as assigned, I currently offer a walking campus tour a handful of times each year through our human resources office to all new hires of the college. Now, do I consider myself a campus expert? Certainly not, but this is certainly a topic near and dear to my heart. And I'm so happy to be with you today, though I wish we could be together in person this coming weekend to celebrate your 50th reunion. I'm glad so many of you are joining us today and can connect, albeit virtually. As part of the college's increased effort to offer online programming during this pandemic, I offered this same tour about a month ago to Holy Cross alumni and friends and we had a great response. I know some of you here today participated in that late April online event. And I was humbled when your classmates, John Hussey and Tom Mulvihill asked me to repeat this program exclusively for the great class of 1970 as part of your 50th reunion celebration. Now today, we'll be together for just about an hour. I encourage you to use the chat function located on your toolbar to communicate with your classmates throughout the presentation. You're also welcome to submit questions at any time using the Q&A function also on your toolbar. I will set aside time at the end to try and answer as many of your questions as possible. Now, one more housekeeping point. I tried to format this tour in a fun, informative, and interactive way. Now, while it certainly doesn't take the place of a true in-person tour, where you can actually see and maybe feel the Holy Cross sites, we'll do our best to replicate those experiences under the current virtual conditions. This will be fun, though. Now, we'll begin with this tour's true architect, the late Father Tony Kuznevsky. Father K, as many affectionately called him, was a beloved faculty member in the college's history department for several decades. He was also a longtime athletic chaplain and friend to numerous students, alumni, and families. He sadly passed away in 2016, but his memory certainly lives on. Now, Father K literally wrote the book on Holy Cross, which was published in 1994, titled Thy Honored Name, A History of the College of the Holy Cross. And he is proudly holding a copy of that book in the photo on the right. Now, Father K developed the framework for this tour as a way to educate students about the college, and the campus they call home during their four years on Mount St. James. Now, many of us, even alumni, students, parents, we walk past buildings, statues, and other campus objects and may not know A, what they are. We're walking by these on a daily or yearly basis. We don't know what they are. And B, we don't really know how they relate to Holy Cross's history. This tour, crafted by Father Kuznevsky, aims to educate and expand our collective horizons and deepen our knowledge of Alma Mater. Now, in the spirit of Father K, who was a true teacher at heart, I want to start with a pop quiz. Now, don't worry. This won't be graded. Your diplomas, even after 50 years, won't be revoked. So what I'm going to do is, I'm gonna put up a question that you should see on your screen momentarily. How many acres 
comprise the Holy Cross campus. We'll take a moment to let you submit. I promise this would be interactive. How many acres comprise the Holy Cross campus? Wait a couple more seconds. Now, if you already took this tour, you should recuse yourself from this. That's cheating. All right. You get a lot of responses. All right, I'm going to share the results with you. All right. Most of you, the majority of you, said 174 acres. We've got a few for 226. Nobody for 52. For 52. I got to say, most of you are all on the right track. I'll stop, uh, stop sharing this. Um, let's see. In, in true kind of Jesuit fashion, this was a little bit of a trick question. Um, the right answer, 226 acres comprise the Holy Cross campus today. And that includes the contiguous kind of main campus um, in Worcester, 174 acres, um, the campus that you uh, got to know and love during your time on, on, as students. Um, but recently, in the last, say, decade or so, um, the college has expanded. Um, we now own 52 acres um, and, in West Boylston, Massachusetts, located about 15 to 20 minutes from, uh, from our Worcester campus. Um, and that's the site of our Joyce Contemplative Center, a beautiful facility. If you haven't had a chance um, to experience it, I would highly recommend it. Um, I know the, the college chaplains um, host a number of alumni retreats throughout the year, um, and it's, it's beautiful. The, the picture at the, at the bottom right kind of showcases it a little bit. It overlooks the Wachusett Reservoir. Um, but since 2016, technically, the college has grown. So if you want to think of almost Holy Cross as like a map of the U.S., um, the main campus is like the contiguous 48 states. Um, and now the new Joyce Contemplative Center is our Alaska and Hawaii. So 226 is the official answer. Um, now, rather than structure this tour chronologically, um, I'm taking a page from Father Kay's tour experience, and I'm gonna organize it spatially as though we're walking around campus together. Now, since this is virtual and the many hills and steps of Mount St. James aren't a factor, I figured we could start at the bottom of the hill and work our way up. So we're gonna do that. At the bottom of the hill, the Blackstone River. Um, this picture, on the top um, is probably from the 1870s or 1880s. Um, we're going to get into that a little bit more, but we know that because O'Kane is not connected to Fenwick. Um, and I chose this picture because it really showcases the river. Um, the picture on the bottom right is one that I snagged from Google Earths. Um, and this is the river today, similar location um, from where the image on the top would, would have been taken. Um, if you walk or you drive by um, this, this spot, um, it's, it's going to be easy to miss um, between Southbridge Street, Route 12, or the on or off ramps to Interstate 290. Um, the Blackstone River today is, is kind of buried, very much so. Um, but this river begins its trek down to Rhode Island, right at the foot of Mount St. James. And part of the reason why the, uh, the location of the college was chosen was because of where the river was and its impact on the land. Um, you know, not many people might know that the Blackstone River Valley is considered by many to be the birthplace of the American Industrial Revolution. Um, because just, just a few miles south um, in Pawtucket, Rhode Island, along the banks of this river, the new nation's first um, textile mill um, was built. Um, and that was in 1790, about 50 years before Holy Cross was founded. And that mill 
was a water powered cotton spinning factory. So the Blackstone and its connections to Worcester, to central Massachusetts are pretty strong. And Holy Cross, um, our history is kind of interwoven um, with, the, with the river as well. Um, and I wanna tell a little story um, that kind of highlights that. In July of 1852, so Holy Cross founded in 1843, was not quite a decade old. Um, there were only a few buildings on campus. Um, Fenwick Hall um, was pretty much the most prominent building. Um, that's where students um, lived. That's where they took their meals. That's where they um, went to class. That's where Jesuits lived. Well, that building, Fenwick Hall, suffered a terrible fire in July of 1852. Devastating. Um, when the alarm sounded and firefighters from the Worcester area came to, to put it out, um, they had a hard time, A, getting to Fenwick Hall, but then B, getting access to water. Um, so on that fateful day in July of 1852, they actually created a series of hoses and pumping engines from the Blackstone River um, up the hill to fight the fire. And it, it caused about an hour delay and that delay was devastating. And it was that delay that pretty much led to the ruin of Fenwick Hall. Um, we'll get to this a little bit later. Fenwick Hall rose from the ashes and clearly it still exists today. Um, but I just wanted to share that, that little story because it, it just paints how the college's history and the Blackstone River um, are intertwined um, and, and our location plays a big role in that. Um, moving a little bit higher up the hill, you know, this is, this is a, a field where probably you've spent many a time. Um, Fit and Field, um, built in 1905 or it opened its gates in 1905. Um, it's, it's seen many, many famous games, many, many famous student athletes. Um, the 1952 Holy Cross baseball team, the College World Series champions, called Fit and Field their home. Still the only school in New England uh, to capture that title. Um, the football field saw numerous historic teams and uh, student athletes play on that field. Vince Permuto from the class of 1960 went on to uh, NFL fame. He's in the ring of honor for the Washington Redskins. Um, Gordy Lockbaum, class of 1988, um, two-time Heisman Trophy finalist. He played there. Um, but did you know that Fit and Field actually wasn't the first outdoor athletic field um, at Holy Cross? Um, that distinction takes place a little bit higher up on the hill. And I like to show this, um, this aerial. Um, this, is, this is gold. From what we can tell, it's the oldest known aerial um, image of the campus. It was taken around 1918, around 1918. Um, I'm gonna, uh, there's a cool feature here where I can actually have a laser pointer. There we go. Um, so here's Fit and Field. Um, so if it was built in 1905, it was a little over a decade old when this image was taken. Um, but higher up the hill, right here, this baseball field um, was in fact the college's first outdoor athletic field. And it was built in the, in the early 1890s when O'Kane Hall was being excavated, when the foundations for Fenwick were going in, the college took a lot of that earth that was excavated and created the field. Um, and here's actually an image. Um, it's, it's a little pixely, um, but this is an image from the first baseball game played on that field. Um, it's from 1893, um, and it's a game between Holy Cross and Georgetown. 
Um, we don't know what the final score of the game is, unfortunately, but um, we can certainly assume that the Crusaders most likely than not came out on top. Um, this field um, could uh, accommodate about 4,000 spectators. Um, and this is the late 1890s, um, the beginning of the 20th century. Baseball was king. Baseball truly was our national pastime. Um, football would, would start to come into prominence, especially on, on the intercollegiate level um, a few decades later. Um, so baseball was king and this was Holy Cross's first field. It would be on this field where um, Louis Sock Alexis, the, uh, the famous um, Holy Cross student um, who would go on to a pretty prominent Major League Baseball career, he would have played on this field in 1895, 1896, before he transferred to Notre Dame. Um, so I just wanted to point that out, that fit and field, though it has existed for well over a century, actually is not the first outdoor athletic field on campus. Um, this baseball field, which now um, is the site of the present day Stein Hall, Carlin Hall, um, and also parts of uh, Kimball Hall are located one tier up from, uh, from fit and field. We're making our way a little bit higher up the hill. This must be a familiar building. Kimball Hall built or opened, excuse me, in 1935. Um, pretty much the only major building project that took place during the depression era. Um, it, uh, when, it, when it opened its doors, it had a seating capacity of 888, which made it the largest indoor dining facility on a college campus in the country. Even now, a um, little over 80 years later, it is still one of the largest um, dining facilities um, in the country. Not the largest anymore, but one of. Um, and it was during your time as, as students that um, you, know, you would have enjoyed student waiters, um, family style dining. Um, and it was in 1971 or 72, um, a few years after you graduated, that um, the college moved to more cafeteria style dining. The, uh, the image on the, on the left was taken during the mid 60s. Um, you could see the uh, student waiters dressed in white. Um, and then the photos obviously on the right are more modern. Now, over time, um, Kimball has seen facelifts. It's seen new carpeting. It's seen um, you know, new tapestries, a, a touch up of paint, new chairs. Um, but one little hidden gem is the tables, the original tables um, that, were, that were built to accommodate the, the, the facility in 1935 are the current tables still in existence, um, which means that multiple generations of Holy Cross students have dined on those same tables. Um, so grandparents, parents, grandchildren, um, even though their Holy Cross experience may be different, um, they all dined on the same table. So that's a little, that's a little gem um, that, that some people don't know. Even after 85 years, those are still the original, the original tables. Um, and I like showing these kind of juxtaposition of, of images um, from the mid 60s to, to today. So some things still, still say the same. Now moving up just a little bit higher, this is a building, kind of the iconic Holy Cross building, um, Fenwick Hall, as its current iteration stands, um, you know, with the spires, you see this on websites, you see this on admissions brochures. This is kind of, um, this is the main um, campus building. Actually, it's uh, listed on the uh, National Register of Historic Places. Uh, both Fenwick and O'Kane are the two Holy Cross buildings that, that, that have that distinction. Um, but the first iteration of Fenwick, and this kind of picks up the story um, when we talked about earlier with the fire, 
um, the first iteration of Fenwick looked very, very different. Um, the image on the left um, dates to about 1845, so maybe a, a year or two after the college was founded. Um, in the first incarnation of Fenwick, the building housed nearly all college space. That included offices, classrooms, dormitories, a chapel. That was the main hub of Holy Cross. Um, and the image of the, the, the man on the, on the right um, was a big influencer of that. That's uh, Bishop Benedict Joseph Fenwick, our founder, the second Catholic Bishop of Boston. He was a Jesuit um, and he purchased the land that became Holy Cross in 1843. Um, prior to that, there was a Catholic um, academy called Mount St. James Academy, um, founded by Father James Fitton. You hear a lot of these names, um, Fitton, Fenwick, there's a lot of buildings and locations on campus named after them. Um, but Bishop Fenwick purchased the land from Father Fitton in 1843. Um, and immediately after that, um, the, the, the academy, Mount St. James Academy was torn down and on its spot, on its footprint, so to speak, um, what became known as Fenwick Hall was then built um, very, very quickly. Um, now, some ask, well, why would the Bishop of Boston be interested in founding a college about 40 miles west? Why didn't he just find some land in the back bay or wherever and build a college there? Um, there's, there, there's a couple of reasons why. Number one, in the 1830s and 1840s, there were strong anti-Catholic tensions in Boston. And the physical remoteness of Worcester was attractive to Bishop Fenwick. Um, in fact, in 1834, so a little less than a decade before Holy Cross was founded, 1834, um, a convent school run by Ursuline sisters in Charlestown, just outside Boston, was burned to the ground by an anti-Catholic mob. Um, so tensions were very high. And this, this act in Charlestown really struck home to Bishop Benwick. One of his first um, major projects as Bishop of Boston was relocating that convent school to the Charlestown location. So when that burned to the ground, um, that really, it really angered Bishop Fenwick. And in his goal to try to build Catholic um, centers of education, um, he didn't want to create one in a location where it could be vulnerable. Um, and when a Worcester site became available, um, it was intriguing to him. Another reason why Worcester was attractive in the late 1830s, early 1840s, was its growth. Um, in the 20 years alone, just before the Civil War, so from 1840 to about 1860, Worcester's population rose from about 7,500 to a little over 25,000. And that was spurred on by the opening of the Blackstone Canal. You know, we talked a little bit about the importance of the, of the Blackstone River Valley. And also Worcester's central location at the intersection of railroad lines connecting Boston, Springfield, and New York City. Um, you know, even today, the nickname of Worcester is the heart of the Commonwealth. Um, and that that geographic location smack dab in the middle of the state um, made the city attractive. And as the industrial revolution um, took shape, Worcester certainly benefited. So those were the two reasons um, why the Mount St. James location in Worcester were attractive to Bishop Fenwick. Um, now, some people ask, well, how did we get our name? Why? Why did he choose College of the Holy Cross? Um, it's, it's, it's a little unusual um, in, in kind of Jesuit circles. When you think of um, Jesuit colleges or universities in the US, 
they often take the name of their of their location. Think of Boston College or um, University of San Francisco, um, or um, those institutions take the name of a religious figure or a Jesuit leader. So think of Xavier University or Loyola of Maryland or Gonzaga University. Um, Holy Cross is a little unique and we got our name because Bishop Fenwick named the college after his cathedral in Boston, the Cathedral of the Holy Cross. Um, that's how we got our name as, a, as an institution. A little unusual in Catholic circles, um, but clearly that, that makes us unique. So we are the College of the Holy Cross because that was the, uh, the, the political and the spiritual seat of Bishop Fenwick when he founded the college. Um, now, after that devastating fire, let me just back up a second. So the college opens its doors in 1843. Um, we graduate our first class in 1849. Um, now the age range of students back then were a little bit different. I've read anywhere that um, you know, we were accepting students as young as maybe seven or eight years old to as old as maybe late 20s or early 30s. Um, the average age of a student back then was probably around 11 or 12, um, which explains why there was that little bit of a gap between 1843, we open our doors, and 1849, we confer our first degrees. Um, but that first class graduates in 1849, just three years later is this devastating fire. Um, you know, the college is barely a decade old. It's fledgling, it's brand new, it's kind of learning its place, and then this terrible tragedy happens. Um, and there were serious thoughts about moving on. Um, you know, there was talk about creating what became known as Boston College in the Boston area. Um, Loyola, Maryland, near the Baltimore area, was opening its doors um, around the 1840s, 1850s. So the Jesuit leaders, both in Rome and in the US, were thinking, well, let's pivot. Maybe we send the faculty down to Baltimore and they can, they can help grow this Loyola, Maryland. Um, but college leaders, Holy Cross leaders were persistent um, and they were able to get the buy-in to give Holy Cross another go. And as an institution, we got a second lease on life. Um, and if you look at Fenwick Hall today, you can kind of see little images of that second lease. You can almost see how Fenwick grew out of the ashes of that terrible fire. Um, so so here, here's an image of Fenwick Hall. Um, the three stories below this white line right here were part of the reconstruction of the facility that took place in the, in the mid 1850s. So just a few years after the devastating fire. Um, then the college ran out of money. Um, and then the second phase of, of renovation and reconstruction took place in the 1860s into the 1870s. And that is when we added the fourth story, the fourth floor, excuse me, of Fenwick and the iconic spires. Um, so even just looking at Fenwick Hall, you can see in the architecture kind of the different phases of reconstruction. Anything below the white line um, was in the early phases. Anything above the white line, including the spires, were in the second phases. And, and Father Kuznevsky and other historians seem to think that the original Fenwick Hall before the fire was probably to the height of this white line right here. It's a three-story building. Um, but some other cool things about Fenwick um, is Commencement Porch, um, which was kind of the center, not only of campus graduations, um, but also kind of just campus gatherings, campus meetings. Um, the, the image on the left is, is a picture I was able to find um, from graduation in, in 1923. Um, so if you can figure the whole campus, families, faculty probably surrounding 
dignitaries, members of, of, of the Worcester um, region could come to campus. And this is kind of our main outdoor amphitheater, so to speak. Um, and that's the way it was for probably about 50 or so years um, during the second phase of Fenwick Hall. But then um, opinions amongst the Jesuit leaders began to change. And that, what, what really brought it to a point was the building of St. Joseph Memorial Chapel. Prior to, prior to St. Joseph, um, the chapel was located in Fenwick Hall. Um, and we're gonna talk much more about St. Joseph Chapel um, coming up pretty soon. Um, but as that construction project took place, and as Jesuit leaders wanted that to be the spiritual center of campus um, and to be kind of a showy building, um, <coughs> they, they quickly realized that commencement porch um, was blocking the view of that great grandiose uh, piece of architecture. Because um, even, even then, Linden Lane was the main um, entrance to campus. So you, you picture someone arriving on campus, walking up Linden Lane, and then rather than seeing this great um, chapel, um, they, it's, it's blocked by Commencement Porch. So um, in 1824, um, Commencement Porch underwent a renovation and it was reduced in size by between 30 and 40 feet. The stairs, which used to jut right out onto Fenwick Lawn, were, were torn down and reconfigured on the sides as spirals to create kind of this long um, buildup to St. Joseph Chapel. And that's, that's the way it is currently right now. Um, and then one more point about um, Fenwick Hall, and it's the, uh, the legend of the exorcisms. You know, did exorcisms take place on campus? Did they not? Um, you know, there's many myths and legends that there's an exorcism room on campus um, uh, at the junction from where um, Fenwick Hall and O'Kane Hall meet on the fourth floor. There's stairs that lead to a door that, that eventually lead to a fifth floor. Um, and for, for decades, there's been speculation that that's the room, that's the exorcism room, um, which is a great myth and really took off um, right around the time you were students and thereafter um, with the release of The Exorcist, the movie. Um, this, this myth, this legend really persists even to today. Um, well, not to burst anyone's bubbles, um, but there, there, there's nothing in the historical record that states that exorcisms did take place. Um, but as Father Kuznevsky used to say very deftly, there's no records that say exorcisms didn't take place. Um, so this is clearly an example of neither confirming nor denying. Um, certainly the legend and the myth is fun. Um, around Halloween time, it's, it's particularly fun. Um, but the historical record, there's nothing in the college annals um, that state that exorcisms took place. But one thing that did um, take place, um, which is uh, the stuff of, of legends and myths, is a great caper. I, I dubbed it the great bell caper. Um, shortly after um, Fenwick Hall got its second lease on life, um, the Jesuits had a 400 pound copper bell cast in the foundry, formerly owned by Paul Revere right outside Boston. Um, and in 1854, um, that bell was mounted, <coughs> excuse me, into Fenwick Hall. Um, and for about a century or so, that bell became the timepiece of the college. It would tell students when to wake up when to go to class, when to eat, when to go to mass. Um, and it was just a part of Fenwick Hall. In fact, the bell was, um, was in existence. I don't know if it was used, but it was, it was there mounted in Fenwick Hall during your time at, at Holy Cross. Um, in, in 1974, um, during the, the early years of Father Brooks's presidency, um, he had the bell um, removed um, and taken to a new location 
around the corner onto uh, O'Kane Lawn, kind of right at the top of Linden Lane. I think Father Brooks and other Jesuit administrators realized the history of the bell. So in, in a sense, they put it on display. They, they um, created a nice little plaque that told the story of the bell and whatnot. And, and I've read, and Father Kuznevsky would say that part of the reason why Father Brooks decided to move it was he was just getting tired of one too many student pranksters um, scaling the heights of, um, of either O'Kane or Fenwick during the night to ring the bell um, and maybe causing some other mischief. So he decided, well, we'll put a stop to that and we'll, we'll, we'll relocate it um, down on the ground. Um, and that's where it, that's where it was housed. I mean, during my four years on campus, I walked past it many a time, didn't really think much of it. Um, but the story takes a turn in April of 2009 when the bell was stolen. It was stolen in broad daylight. I wish I could say that this was a, a great caper um, in, in the clandestine shield of night um, on a foggy day. No, it was a, it was a bright, sunny, beautiful April uh, morning in 2009, a what seemed to be a service van pulled up, um, workers got out, they, they unscrewed the bell, they unhitched it, um, they uh, carried it um, to their service vehicle and they drove off and nobody thought, nobody thought anything of it. Um, well, um, come, to, come to see, they were not servicemen, um, they were thieves and the bell has never been seen again. Um, some believe because of the value of copper, the bell was probably um, melted down and then sold onto the black market or whatnot. Um, you know, maybe this is a case of like Indiana Jones um, and, 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 and the Last Crusade that maybe the bell is in some um, old warehouse just sitting there for us to find. There was no note, there was no ransom. Um, the bell just left. Um, so now this stanza um, in our alma mater, um, you know, ring out, ring out, O oh, Tower Bell, our alma mater's triumphs tell to those who love her name so well. Holy Cross, oh, Holy Cross. It sounds nice, but it rings a little bit hollow, certainly pun intended. There is no um, Tower Bell anymore. Um, another cool story, not too far from where the Tower Bell was located, is Dinan Library. Um, it opened its doors in 1927. Um, it was what the college what Father Kuznetsky referred to as the million dollar campaign shortly after the First World War with enrollment skyrocketing. Um, the college underwent a very massive capital building project. Um, Dianan Library was opened, Carlin Hall was opened, and St. Joseph Memorial Chapel was opened. So Dianan was part of this kind of post-World War I um, building campaign. Um, and this photo was taken, I, I found it from maybe the mid 50s or so. I like, I like the image of the car in the foreground. Um, and this definitely is one of the, the academic centers of the campus even today. Um, but Dine and Library's archives and special collections is home to many rare and unusual publications, artwork, objects. And one of my favorite is a mummy. Um, that's the image on the right. Um, the college is in possession of a 2,500 year old Egyptian mummy and coffin. Um, the mummy is a 29 inch um, mummy of a young girl. Um, and I'm probably going to butcher the name, but it's called Tanit Panikau. Tanit Panikau. Um, and in ancient Egyptian, that's translated to daughter of the magic god. And it was gifted to the college in 1896 by an alumnus named Peter Skelly. God knows how Mr. Skelly got his hands on this mummy, um, but he gifted it to the college and it's been in our possession ever since. Its home now is in Dianan Library. Um, it was restored in the early 2000s 
Um, and then occasionally it's placed on display in the main reading room. So the next time you come to campus, if you have a couple minutes to spare, pop into Dine and Library and you may get to see our mummy. Um, during that restoration, conservators believe that the girl's approximate date of death was around 650 BC, 650 BC. So we can probably comfortably assume that this mummy is the oldest object currently on Mount St. James. Um, its sarcophagus is beautifully painted um, and there's ancient hieroglyphics um, on its side and also etched along the front as well. So this is, this is something that um, not many people may know, um, but we like to point out that there are these really cool, unusual objects that are very much hidden um, in plain sight. Um, and here's one, um, St. Joseph Memorial Chapel. Um, this also was part of that million dollar campaign during the 1920s. It, it opened its doors in 1924 um, to account for the growing need for chapel space. After the First World War, the college saw a surge of enrollment um, and the chapel was at the time located in Fenwick Hall. Um, and we just ran out of space. And the Jesuit leaders um, wanted to create a building that really represented our, our Catholic, our Jesuit roots. Um, so that was kind of the, the impetus for building the structure. Um, the architect that we contracted with, his name was Charles McGinnis, he and his firm located in the Boston area. And they would go on to design many other buildings on campus. Um, but Mr. McGinnis, um, when he got this contract, um, wanted to create a building um, that um, had connections to Jesuit heritage. Um, so he ultimately opted for a Renaissance revival style. And the style was chosen because it's in the tradition of Jesuit architecture from the late 1500s, um, when um, the Society of Jesus were building structures throughout Europe as part of its efforts to combat the Reformation. Um, and one of the buildings that served as an inspiration for the design of St. Joseph Chapel is the Jesu, the Church of the Jesu, the mother house of the Society of Jesus located in Rome. Um, you can see striking similarities um, between those two structures, that the Jesu and similar buildings um, that were constructed um, in the late 1500s served as an inspiration um, for for St. Joseph Memorial Chapel. So next time you're on campus or next time you're in Rome, you can kind of see the similarities for yourself. Um, but I like to show this picture because it, it, it really harkens to um, the college's connections to the Society of Jesus and it spills well beyond our shores here in America. Um, but the building itself, I mean, one of my favorite buildings on campus um, beautiful, beautiful structure. Um, and, and you can see that when we're not in a pandemic, we can understand why um, trying to get married in this space um, is very popular amongst alumni. And, you know, if you're, if you're choosing to have a wedding in the spring or the summer or some of the early fall months, you might have to get in line because it's a, it's a popular it's a popular wedding destination. Um, but this structure, this building opened its doors in 1924. The total cost was about $300,000, which equates to a little over $5 million in today's um, money. Um, and Father Kuznevsky would often say that was a wonderful, wonderful bargain. Um, but when um, the chapel was opened, the Jesuits actually ran out of money. Um, so the original windows were clear, and it wasn't until two years later that the stained glass was added. Um, and they are absolutely gorgeous. Um, and like most churches um, and other um, buildings that employ stained glass, um, ours tell a story. 
um, ours does. Um, and this slide, I want to credit uh, Professor Virginia Regan from the uh, from the Holy Cross Visual Arts Department. She she crafted this map, um, but it illustrates um, each of the each of the stained glass in the main part of the chapel. All the images on the uh, on the left represent either scholars or doctors of the church um, to symbolize kind of the location of St. Joseph Chapel in a place of higher learning. Um, this truly is a college chapel. All the images on the right represent martyrs of the church. Um, and this is to symbolize um, the connection of the, of the church, um, of St. Joseph Chapel, to the, 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 the larger Catholic community, um, Christian community, but also it plays in mind what the name of the chapel is. So it's St. Joseph Memorial Chapel, dedicated to all alumni who lost their lives in service to our country um, during wars. Um, so the, the, the so choosing um, martyrs, um, Catholic martyrs, Christian martyrs, is a tie to that of giving one's life for a cause greater than one's own, whether it's country, whether it's faith. Um, so that was the reason why, um, why scholars and then martyrs were chosen. Um, and as you walk through the chapel, the, the, the imagery is beautiful. This, this doesn't do justice because this is on a, on a page, um, but I wanted to show a, a sampling of, of two of them. Uh, on the left, Ignatius of Loyola. So he's on, the, he's on the, the scholar side, the doctors of the church, the founder of the Society of Jesus, a scholar himself. Um, and then on the right, Mary, Queen of Martyrs, um, to symbolize um, you know, the martyrdom for one's faith. And, and you see the, the very beautiful image on the bottom here, the Pieta, Mary cradling um, her son at the foot of the cross. Um, but just beautiful. Again, if you, if you get a chance to visit campus and can spend some time walking around St. Joseph Chapel, um, these, these stained glass are just beautiful. And they actually underwent a renovation a few years ago. So the colors just absolutely pop. Um, I just like to point that out because they really do kind of tell a story and again, root um, the building um, to, to, to our Jesuit, to our Catholic heritage, um, which, is, which is pretty neat, pretty neat. Now, right outside the chapel is the, uh, the campus cemetery. This is unusual. You don't see a lot of these on college campuses, a few, but not, not all. Um, and what I like to, to point out about the cemetery is um, contrary to popular belief, not everyone buried in the cemetery was a member of the college's faculty or Jesuit community. I, I guess for, you know, when I was a student, I would cut through here many a time um, on my way to class, on my way to Kimball. And I just assumed, okay, well, these are all um, men who were either teachers or alumni or, or whatnot and had a connection to Holy Cross. That's, that's not necessarily the case. For about a hundred years, um, Holy Cross was home to one of the only Jesuit cemeteries in the East. So as a result, Boston area or New England Jesuits, when they passed away, many a time um, were buried here, even if they did not have a connection to the college. Um, that changed in 1939 um, when Campion Center in Weston, Massachusetts was built. Um, Weston is right outside Boston. A cemetery was erected there. And from 1939 on, um, any New England area Jesuit who passes away is, is buried there. Um, so really for the last 80 years or so, um, only Holy Cross affiliated Jesuits have been interred here. Um, so that talks a little bit about the history of the, of the cemetery. And I point out this, this, this picture on the bottom left. Um, and it shows the cover of a very, very fascinating book that I would highly recommend. It's named Beneath the Cross, and it was published this past summer, 
summer of 2019 um, in celebration of the college's 175th anniversary. Um, it was written by Sarah Campbell, assistant archivist in the college's archives and special collections. And that book really tells the story of the cemetery, but it also tells the story of the men um, interred there and, and the amazing um, impact that they had, not only at Holy Cross, but in their chosen areas of discipline. Um, it tells some hilarious stories as well. Um, so I would highly recommend that book. I know it's available um, through the Holy Cross bookstore. I believe it's available through Amazon and other, other online outlets, um, but I would definitely, definitely highly, highly recommend it. Um, so now I thought it would be fun to, let me see. I'm going to change. All right, I'm going to change to a pointer. I've got another pop quiz that I thought would be fun as we approach the end of our uh, of our journey together. Okay, here we go. Here's another pop quiz. It should show up. What is the oldest building currently on campus? What is the oldest building? currently on campus. I encourage you to give your best guess. Campion House, Fenwick Hall, O'Kane Hall, or the old campus bakery. I'll wait a couple more seconds. Again, your degrees won't be revoked. This is just a fun, a fun quiz. What is the oldest building currently on campus? I'll give it another five seconds or so. Oh wow, the results are results are all over the place. All right, I'm going to end this and I'm going to share the results. So most of you say the old campus bakery. A few have votes under Fenwick Hall, O'Kane. Okay. So we seem to be all over. Again, I I I cannot stump you. You are you are all right on par um, because, whoops, the answer is the old campus bakery, um, the image on the left. Um, one of my favorite buildings on campus. Um, it was built around the mid 1800s, around the time Holy Cross was founded. Um, and it's still there today, it really is. Um, what's cool about this building is it shows how present the threat of fire was during that time where you're going to take all cooking, all baking, anything that's involving an open flame and physically removing it from Fenwick Hall. Um, and it was in the early 20th century um, when the bakery was closed down and relocated inside. Um, but to me, this is just kind of a fun little building. If there's any any followers of J.R.R. Tolkien and the Lord of the Rings series. Um, you know, when I walk past this, I often think that Bilbo Baggins or another hobbit's gonna poke his or her head out of there. Um, you know, I think it would, it would be cool if it were reconverted into like a coffee shop, maybe named the Hobbit House or something like that. Um, right now, um, Holy Cross Grounds uses the facility. Um, and, you know, if we were to pry open that little door, we would see fertilizer, we would see seeds, we would see other things like that, um, shovels, whatnot. Um, many people often think that Campion House, the building on the right, is the oldest building on campus. And it, it's, it, they're, they're, that's, a, that's a pretty viable um, guess, um, but, that, but it's not the right answer. Campion opened its doors around 1906, 1907. Um, and it was originally built to house farm workers, many of them Irish immigrants working on campus. Right now, it's the home of the, uh, the office of the college chaplains. Um, but over the decades, it has had multiple, multiple purposes. It was a laundromat. It was a pizza house. It was a coffee shop. Believe it or not, it was a residence for ex-GIs shortly after the Second World War. Um, and Father Kuznevsky would often say that it's a loose reconstruction of the original Mount St. James Academy um, founded 
by Father Fitton. Um, and, and that was kind of the building um, that, that housed that academy. It was raised when Bishop Fenwick bought the land and then Fenwick Hall kind of grew in its spot. But Father Kuzneski would say that it's, it's not exact, but it's a very loose reconstruction to that, to that past history on the hill. And as we wind near the end of our, of our tour, I do like to point this out, um, Easy Street, um, affectionately named because it's uh, one of the only, um, you know, straight, straight um, shots on campus if you're walking. Um, and this is where a lot of the residence halls are located. The, the image in front of you is Healy Hall. Um, and it was after the Second World War that a lot of these residence halls were built. Um, let's see. Hanselman and, and Lehigh were built in the, uh, the mid-1950s. Um, Healy and Clark, this building, followed in the early 1960s. And then Milady, now, now named Brooks Milady Hall, um, was the last of the Hill dorms to come online um, in, the, in the late 1960s. Um, and the reason for these, these buildings to take shape was enrollment skyrocketed after the Second World War. Um, and the, the administrators of the campus needed a place um, to, to put students. Um, so they were moved out of residence halls in O'Kane and in Fenwick, and then started to, uh, started to live here. Um, but I like to point these out because there is some iconography, there are some statues that are present, but are hidden. And um, I just like to, talk a little bit about the meaning of those. And this, these images that you see is another angle of Healy Hall. Um, and, and this image, this statue here, I'll, I'll be honest, I, I, I walked past many a time and I, I just assumed, okay, maybe it's a past president, maybe it's Ignatius of Loyola, whatnot. Um, but these statues, which are, which are present in most of the Hill dorms, do tell a story. Um, they represent Jesuit saints, all of whom are connected to the first Jesuit college in Rome. Um, the image here is Robert Bellarmine, um, who was a uh, bishop and doctor of, excuse me, a cardinal and doctor of the church. Um, he became famous for being embroiled in the Galileo controversy over whether the earth or the sun was the center of the solar system. Um, on Lehigh Hall, there's John Birchman's, um, who is, uh, was a Jesuit scholastic. Um, on Hanselman, St. Stanislaus Koska, a Polish Jesuit who was the patron saint of Jesuit novices. Um, and then on Clark Hall, there's Aloysius Gonzaga, um, who's the patron saint of Jesuit scholastics. Um, and Father Kuznevsky was puzzled by this. He still has not found any, any, any historical record to say why these images were chosen for the different dorms. Um, again, all four men are Jesuit saints. All four men have a connection um, to the first Jesuit college in Rome. So perhaps um, they're, they're there as models of um, scholarly pursuits and um, you know, trying to create a beacon for, for current students of what to follow and how to live um, meaningful lives. Who knows? What's interesting is Robert Bellarmine lived to, to, to an old age, but the other three, Birchman's, Koska, and Gonzaga, all died very young. They all died before their mid-20s, um, mid um, mostly through either sickness or whatnot. Um, so it's just interesting why those images were chosen. Um, but I, I want to point out that under our current kind of global circumstances, um, Aloysius Gonzaga um, is, is, is taking on some considerable attention because um, he's also the patron saint of plague victims. Um, he died in Rome shortly after he graduated from the Jesuit college there, ministering to plague victims. Um, so during this, um, during this uncertain time, um, uh, an added prayer to, uh, to St. Gonzaga, um, you know, might be, 
might be worthwhile. Um, but I do, do like to point these out, that these are images that um, are very much there, but, but people don't often notice them. And I do want to end with um, the Campus Arboretum. Um, now, these are things that chances are you've walked past countless times. Um, many trees on campus sport metal tags, little dog tag that you see on the, on the lower left-hand side. Um, about 700 trees, in fact. Um, on windy days, depending on where you're walking, you can almost hear the little rattle of the dog tags. Each tag represents a number, which then um, represents a, uh, a coding in, a, in an arboretum book. Because since 1983, the campus is a registered arboretum, a place where a variety of trees and shrubs are grown for study and for display. Um, when you were students, there were roughly 700 trees or shrubs scattered throughout campus. Today, there are about 6,000, representing about 115 different varieties of trees and shrubs. Um, and about every decade or so, the, the grounds division comes out with an arboretum book. Um, and this, this poem um, that, that I snagged from that is from the most recent edition in 2009, the third edition, um, attributed to a, uh, a Jesuit who was a professor of English at the turn of the century. Um, I just thought that was a fun quote and very appropriate um, for, for a conversation about the Arboretum. Um, but most tags um, list information that correlates to that Arboretum guide. Um, but many trees on campus are named after people. They're named after alumni. They're named after um, Jesuits. They're named after faculty members, whatnot. Um, and some of them are pretty, pretty famous names. Um, here's an image of the, of the Teddy Roosevelt tree planted by Roosevelt himself in 1905 when he was the commencement speaker on campus. He was the sitting president at the time. So that was a big, big deal, not only for Holy Cross, but for central Massachusetts. And after that commencement, um, he planted this Scotch elm. Um, and I chose this image because it, it, it shows a little bit of where it's located on campus. It's in the lower part of campus, overlooking the baseball field. Um, in this image, they're doing some maintenance work on it. But if you visited Fit and Field, if you've gone to a football game, if you've walked down um, Kimball, or excuse me, Fitton Avenue, you would have passed this tree. It's nondescript. There isn't a, um, a plaque, there isn't a marker there. Um, but I wanted to point that out as the, as the Teddy Roosevelt tree. But chances are you've probably seen this tree somewhere else and you didn't even know it. Um, and this, 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 is a, this is a fun one. Um, this, this is an image I'm, I'm guessing you, you may have seen. Um, a young Ted Williams, 20 year old, um, right out of San Diego. This is his first at bat as a member of the Red Sox in April of 1939. Um, the Sox were in town. They were, they were uh, scrimmaging Holy Cross on their way to Boston to start the season. Um, and this was Ted's first at-bat, though it wasn't in an official major league game, but it was his first at-bat as a member of the Red Sox at Holy Cross. Um, this is a very famous, iconic photo in itself. But one of those trees in the background um, is the Teddy Roosevelt tree. Um, and I like to end here just to, just to emphasize how there are such hidden gems on our campus um, that really tell the, the, the story and the history of our college that are hidden in plain sight. Um, and through the work of Father Kuznevsky, um, we're, we're just so, so blessed to be able to bring them to life and to share them with all of you. Um, so on that, I will pause. That's the end of my formal presentation. Um, and, and I'll see if, if any of you have questions. Um, you know, thank you for your attention. And, um, you know, I still, we, I know we still have 
a little bit more time together. So I'm going to uh, try to answer as many of these as possible. If you would forgive me, I'm going to take a drink of water. And please ask any more questions that you might have. Um, I'll try my best to answer as many of them as possible. We've got one here. Um, it's an interesting one, and it relates to um, it relates to St. Joseph Chapel. Um, someone is asking when was compulsory mass um, lifted. Um, the answer is over two over two periods, and it was kind of phased out. Um, during the ninth, so, so compulsory mass, um, you know, you often hear of, of Purple Knights from the classes in the 1940s or the 50s. They'll visit campus for reunion or whatnot, and they'll go into the chapel and they'll sit in their seat where they were assigned because um, students during the, 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 the weekday, Monday through Friday, um, had to go to mass and they had an assigned seat and an assigned row. Um, that, that was eased a little bit during the Second World War, or after the Second World War, um, as the college saw a surge in enrollment, um, the, the, the president at the time um, moved compulsory mass to every other day because we just didn't have enough space. Um, and then that prompted the renovation of Mary Chapel below St. Joseph Chapel. Um, and when that came online, then daily mass was, was reinstituted. Um, it wasn't until um, 1962 when um, Father Swords, president at the time, um, got rid of compulsory mass um, just because of what was happening in the church, what was happening in the, in the states. Um, though he did encourage students to still go regularly and frequently, it was not mandated. So it's been since 1962 that compulsory mass um, was was changed. We have a very interesting question about um, the the college and its its connections. This is this is going back in the early days. The college's connections to the uh, to the Confederacy or to the Union, um, which is a very interesting question because the college was just kind of opening its doors when the uh, when the Civil War. Um, broke out. Um, from what we can tell, there were about 25 um, either students or alumni who fought in the Civil War. Um, about 20 of them on the Union side, about five of them for the Confederacy. Um, and of those, say, 25 students or alumni, eight of them passed away. So we had eight um, veterans of, of, of the Civil War. Um, another really interesting tidbit that kind of relates to the Civil War and kind of the college's history is when we opened our doors in 1843, and again, it was a, it was a hodgepodge group of students who kind of came of all different ages, but the first student to show up um, was a man by the name of Edward Scott. Um, he was an immigrant from Ireland um, and came to Holy Cross. He was literally our first student. Um, after he graduated, he moved down south and he actually fought for the Confederacy um, in an Alabama regiment. He survived the war and then he would go on to become a faculty member at Spring Hill College in Mobile, Alabama. Um, which is a Jesuit institution. So that's kind of an interesting little little tidbit um, and connection between Holy Cross and the Civil War that technically our first student fought for the CSA. Um, let's see. Any interesting facts about Alumni Hall? I do have some interesting facts. If you if you swear me to secrecy, for anyone who might be interested, um, I am doing a part two of this tour um, I, I, on June 18th. Um, so the, the, the tour that I gave just now and then I gave a few weeks ago, I'm giving a part two and Alumni Hall is going to be, uh, is going to be featured in that. But 
Um, so if you promise not to tell anyone um, some, some interesting facts about alumni, I, I will share them. Um, one thing that's cool is alumni, um, well, it was built in 1905, uh, 1904, 1905. Um, it was the first building on campus to be constructed with electricity. Um, uh, electricity was becoming more and more common um, in, the, in the 1890s and the early days of the 20th century. But on campus, um, it was used makeshift um, in one of the chapels and whatnot, but alumni was the first building from construction to have electricity. And, and from what I've been able to find, the, the switches for, for the lights were located in the Jesuit prefect room. So when, um, you know, Father Cadigan says lights out, it, he, meant, he meant lights out. Um, very interesting kind of um, kind of control mechanisms back then. Um, you know, another thing about alumni is um, there's a cupola located on the top of it. Um, and there's some thought amongst the research of Father Kuznevsky that that might be an, a, an homage to the original um, Fenwick Hall, which sported a, which sported a cupola. Um, I don't know if I can go back. I don't know if I can go back in my slide, but the, the original Fenwick Hall, the one that burnt down, had a cupola. So there's some thought that maybe the cupola on alumni, and then there's a mirror one across Kimball Quad on Carlin. That might be kind of a, an, an homage to, to the early building. Um, and then the last thing about alumni that I, that I learned is the architect, who actually is the same architect who designed St. Joseph Memorial Chapel. Um, he wanted the building to look old, to look kind of ornate. What that means, I don't really know. So he had, um, he had brick grounded up into the mortar, and he also had pink sand added to the mortar um, so that the, the, the facade of the building would have kind of a different look. And, and I, I was on campus um, last week just walking around and I, I walked past alumni and it's, it's true. Um, if you look at alumni hall, the brick, it, it's, it's kind of a brighter color. It's almost like it had a, it had a paint job or something. Um, so those are my, those are my tidbits on alumni hall. So those are good, good questions. Um, was alumni or Carlin first called Loyola? Um, it was Carlin. So alumni, when it opened its doors, was dedicated to all the alumni of Holy Cross. Um, so if you ever wanted a building named after you, um, technically we all have one in Alumni Hall. Carlin was originally named after the founder of the Jesuits, Ignatius of Loyola. Um, it, was, it was changed a few decades later to, to be named after Father Carlin, um, who, was a, who was president um, at the time of that, that million dollar campaign, but it originally opened its doors as Loyola. And then when the Jesuit residency behind the chapel, you know, located behind the chapel here, that then became Loyola Hall. Um, but, but for the first few years, yeah, in the thirties and forties, it was, it was Loyola Hall. Um, another question here, where was the bell housed in Fenwick? That's a good question. From, from what I can tell in one of the spires, I don't know if it was, if you're looking at Fenwick kind of coming up from, um, from Kimball Quad, I don't know if it was the left or the right, but one of those was where the bell was housed. And um, you know, how students scaled that, as God bless them, but um, you know, supposedly in the late 60s into the 70s, it was becoming a, a common occurrence. And, Father Brooks decided to, to nip it in the bud and, and to physically get rid of it. Um, and I think, I think that's all for questions. Um, you know, thank you all for your, for your attention. And this was a lot of fun. And um, you know, I, I wish you all all well. And I, and I can't wait um, to when we can all be on campus together to, 
to celebrate each other and, and to celebrate, um, you know, the great class of 1970. So, um, so thank you very much. Have a great rest of the day. Um, and it's been a pleasure. It really has. So enjoy your day.